Uh, I hope you're all back from your various breaks. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Notaro uh, from the University of Dundee, State of the Art AI through the Artificial in Commerce, Artisai. Over to you, Anna. Hi, uh, let me just uh, put this full screen. Okay, I hope you can you can see the slides. All right. Okay, all right. So my name is uh, Anna Notaro. I'm a media theory scholar based in uh, Duncan or Jordanston College of Art and Design in uh, Dundee, uh, Scotland. Very pleased to be here. Uh, my first EVA conference, in particular on a celebratory uh, year. So the story, the story as far as this presentation is concerned, really starts a few years back in uh, 2009 when uh, I wrote a paper in which I argued that contemporary interest in the human-like artificial actor uh, should have been considered in the context of humanity's fascination with the idea of artificial life created from inanimate materials. Now, such a fascination is evidenced in the proliferation of stories uh, and artifacts which express the mingled fear and desire for autonomous machines, which can either make humans entirely redundant or in the more optimistic scenario, provide a solution to the limitations of our imperfect bodies. As it will be, become clear later on, there is an interesting parallelism between the early 20th century's idea of dispensing with the services of human actors, as see, for example, Craig's marionette theater, Artos, puppets, Meyerhold, biomechanical actors, uh, or Schlemmer's uh, puppets, um, and today's speculations surrounding the artificial artists. Comparisons have also been drawn with previous art movements, particularly conceptualists. I would suggest that uh, Duchamp's conceptualist ghost is not the only one haunting the machine. Therein lies also the ghost of surrealists like uh, Breton, Ernst, Dali, and Belmer, the creator of strange fetish-like morphed creatures. So as, as we know, uh, morphing is a, a, an established uh, artistic practice and a standard of special effects in Hollywood productions. And yet I find that it has not lost any of its surreal qualities, the dream of the body assembled from different parts uh, in the human-like figures uh, generated in endless loops by today's algorithmic art. But what exactly generated by the algorithm mean? Is there a consensus about what generative art, G-art, is? Does it differ from A-art? Galanter offers some answers when he states that uh, quote, what is definitive about generative art isn't what it is, but rather how it is made. I would qualify the above as a, a pragmatic uh, working definition, for it avoids dwelling on the philosophical questions of ontology. What is the essence of art and creativity in connection to or with technology, while focusing on process instead? This does not mean, of course, that such philosophical questions are not worth asking, as I do in my, uh, in my article. There is no room here to clarify the subtle distinction among the names computer art, net art, electronic art, computer assisted art, and the list could be longer. I refer the, to the Bodden's useful disquisition. What I propose instead is the new umbrella term of guy art, to include current art produced by using AI systems while simultaneously recognizing the influential leg legacy of past generative art. What is occasionally omitted when discussing the history of G-Art and as implication for guy art, as uh, we shall see, is that for early practitioners like Benz, Metzger, Nacke, generative art was tied to a generative understanding of art's political role. And as I was typing these words, my eyes was falling, falling on this uh, gorgeous picture by uh, Cornelia Solfrank, which hangs on the wall of my studio here. 
And over the past 25 years, the German hacker, cyber feminist, conceptual and net artist Cornelia Solfrank has been adapting subversive artistic strategies of the classical avant-garde to digital media under the motto, the smart artist makes the machine do the work. So uh, Solfrank conceived in collaboration with several coders of the net art generator, a program that automatically creates digital collage from pictures available on the internet. Interestingly, similarly, similar concerns are shared uh, by some contemporary guy art practitioners as well. Now, as I start, uh, stated earlier, questions of ontology regarding what constitutes the essence of human art and creativity in connection with technology are challenging, but still worth asking. The main challenge lies in the fact that we struggle to define human creativity, let alone to understand what happens when artists and machine interact to create something new. Is that something art? Is it co-creation? What is sure is that we seem to be obsessed with the idea of creativity, especially with its economic value for the business world. This is because the traditional romantic idea of creativity as a state of being rather than doing has been replaced by a new type of creativity whose main merit lies in making a product that can be measured, tested and ranked. I would argue that Guy Art has revived interest in such questions by stimulating the intellectual energy from critics, academics, and artists by injecting a sense of urgency, given the speedy pace of technological innovation in the AI sector. I don't have time here to revisit, as I do in my article, some previous contributions to these ontological questions regarding creativity. But suffice to say that what emerges is a notion of augmented creativity, one which further enhances that of human creativity as defined by Bowdoin, for example, 10 years ago. Augmentation alone might not uh, settle all the philosophical issues, but perhaps it represents an adequate characterization of the current state of the art. Now, in 2014, computer scientist uh, Ian Goodfellow, as we know, released this influential paper outlining the concept of generative uh, adversarial networks, GANs. Now, Gans came to the attention of the general public in October 2018, when despite an estimated sale uh, price of between $7,000 and $10,000, a portrait entitled Edmond de Bellamy from La Famille de Bellamy sold at Christie's in New York for over $400,000. The name Bellamy was a reference to the creator's name of Gans, Ian Goodfellow, that roughly translated to Bellamy in French. Authors, so-called of the portrait, were obvious, a Paris-based collective of artists, machine learning researchers, and friends interested in AI for art. The sale raised a few eyebrows among art critics and AI artists alike. First of all, the quality of the image was poor, rather local resolution, secondly, it had been produced by an algorithm the artist did not write. And lastly, it was packaged in a gilt frame with a segment of the algorithm code as a, uh, for a signature. Also, the publicity material uh, circulated prior to the sale uh, quoted the artist's motto, creativity isn't just for humans. And it was precisely this motto which uh, stirred up the media hype surrounding the AI portrait and demonstrated obvious willingness to embrace a particular narrative about AI, uh, about AI art, one in which they credit the algorithm for creating their work. Now, misleading statements and attention-seeking attitudes are nothing new in the art world. Uh, AI painting seems to be just the machine learning equivalent of a urinal on a plinth, as a critic put it. The problem with the Bellum is that the portrait is not emotionally charged or inspiring. Its sole interest lies in the way in which it was made. So perhaps it's worth recalling Andy Warhol's famous statement that 
art is what you can get away with. Warhol made business as art, and this is exactly the direction that some AI artists and auction houses like Christie's are taking, to the point that one commentator has compared this current interest in AI art to a gold rush. Now, in the introduction to this presentation, I noted how the ghost of surrealism was haunting the machine. Mario Klingsmann's work uh, is a case in point. The hallmark of uh, Klingerman's aesthetic, explicit in works like Memories of Passers By, is described as haunted. And the artist himself finds parallelism between the surrealist Marx uh, Ernst and his own machine learning based artistic practice. Most of the uh, artists who use AI uh, uh, are keen to retain albeit in different, under different guises, some degree of creative agency in their gun-based productions. Now, Icon's approach is different. Uh, Icon's, created by uh, Hamed Al-Gamal, uses an algorithm called CAN, Creative Adversarial Network, and is unabashedly described as a new system for generating art. I would argue that just like in the, cases, in the case of Christie's Bellamy auction discussed earlier, marketing reasons underpin the narrative of the autonomous AI artist. Akan art is above all a commodity, one which perfectly encapsulates an idea of creativity as measurable and quantifiable. Gone are the flawed subjective aesthetic concepts Akan holds the perfect technological solution to art. Only how ironic if human flows were to be replaced by a culturally biased algorithm trained on 80,000 images taken exclusively from the Western art canon. In a piece entitled Artist in the Cloud, artist and programmer Jean Cogan introduced to the art world Abraham, the first autonomous artificial artist. Hey, hey, hey. Abraham is an open project to make an autonomous artificial artist, a crowdsourced AI that generates art. Adopting a somewhat messianic tone, Abraham was a prophet after all, and Coogan his contemporary incarnation, the AAA is described as quote, a sovereign creative spirit who generates original art. What Coogan has in mind is a generative art program emerging from the collective intelligence, one where the profits for works produced and sold on the market are shared via digital currency among the people who built and feed it. Abraham is an amazingly ingenious and fascinating project one that combines echoes of that mutually beneficial horizontal processes of communication and collaborative action typical of early GR, together with ideas of the hive mind and collective intelligence from the optimistic early days of the internet. However, the predominant characteristic is a kind of messianic techno spiritualism, deeply rooted in established religious tropes. Abraham's homepage refers to covenant, miracles, gospels, and its beta version is called Genesis. For all its emphasis on the benefits of collectivism and distributed agency, one might have expected a different narrative for AAA. Instead, the latest artificial artist turned out to be called Abraham, like the patriarch, known for obeying unquestionably the commands of one God. In conclusion, contrary to Kogan, I have no prophetic inclinations. So I won't be discussing the future of my art or take sides on whether or not the machine will in time reach a degree of consciousness to rival our human capacity to produce art and tell stories. I would recommend instead that we direct our intellectual energies towards investigating the emerging applications of AI as a tool for the organization and categorization of art, 
to detect forgery and influence the art market. Furthermore, it is critical that the conversation regarding the legal implications, ethics and future of art in the art world and not just are interdisciplinary. The question of agency in relation to the use of AI technologies will continue to be paramount. We need to remain alert to the fact that AI offers no neutral technological solution and that such systems are not unclouded by bias. Thank you. You're on mute, Graham. It's on mute, Graham. It off. Okay, all right, sorry, I thought I turned it off and it turned itself back on again. Swing. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, lovely uh, presentation. Uh, interestingly, um, I had the privilege of being one of the uh, judges for Still Image on the Lumen Long List this year. And there were a number of entries on that, which uh, uh, basically were works of art, which had heavily relied on AI to um, make them happen and construct them in the first place. So it does seem to be a, a trend that is happening more and more that we're finding um, artists attempting to go this sort of route. But I think you, you really came up with some very interesting thoughts on it, on uh, particularly on spotting forgeries and things like that, which I hadn't really considered before. So thank you very much. Um, we don't seem to have any particular questions for you right now, so I can move on to our next speaker. If anyone's got any questions for Anna,